Bonsoir, What mes is... amis. Hello, <laughs> friends. Hello. We're here to talk about freedom. freedom. And Chris, without further ado, um, you wish to, to read the, the introductory paragraph? Yes, yeah, sure. What is freedom? Who is free? A little Modernity. bit more energy. Okay. What is freedom? Who is free? Modernity easily exposes itself to the accusation of promoting negative freedom, yes. freedom from, saying precious little of positive freedom, freedom for. Yes. Modern man readily fights for means, but hardly for ends. This phenomenon is retraceable to the Machiavellian reification of natural ends as ideological constructs or ideals. The upshot of the Machiavellian revolution is a world in which we tend to conceive freedom aside from any natural end mm. or aside from any natural hierarchy of ends. Mm. And that is why modernists have precious little to say about the meaning of freedom, even though some become aware of the ultimate implications of the modern revolution, namely the rise of freedom as the universal society. Those partaking in that society will partake in its freedom, while those rejecting that society shall forfeit all freedom. That is a lie, of course, for outside of the sphere of influence of the universal society, there is a broader horizon, allowing us to ask seriously the question, what is freedom? But also, who is free? What is the seat of freedom? Two mutually inextricable questions that open the door to the possibility that everything we have been taught and believed to know about freedom has precious little to do with it. So, oh, thank you. So here Thanks, we're, we, we have gathered to ask uh, all that we had never dared ask before. Um, Exciting. <laughs> Paul, uh, Joachim, uh, uh, any preliminary thoughts about what what Chris read? Yeah, I have some. How about you, Paul? Okay, in, in 10 words or less. Ah, uh, <laughs> very Go nice. Go overboard. It's your birthday. <laughs> well, um, um, there's a correlative in a previous conversation we've had about the individual, of course. Yes. Um, I can't uh, recall that all immediately, but what occurs to me uh, going over this in my head uh, this afternoon was that uh, there's a conflict between the form and the content of this, this freedom of ours. The form being... Uh, the open society uh which is predicated on escape from pain or death uh for the sake of preserving life and pleasure um denial of death, denial of death. and the, the the content of the freedom is well pleasure like i said uh, uh conceived of personally so pleasure necessarily private Supposed to uh, I'd rather call it frustration, but anyway, go ahead. Yes. Um, well, of course, we're always after the next thing, I suppose, aren't we? It's, it's um, systematic frustration. That's that's the reality. But they call it maybe they can call it pleasure. Some people want to call it pleasure, but it's really systematic, endemic frustration. In industrial, corporate, corporately monetized, prolonged frustration. Hmm however you want to put it um but the, there's there's a conflict between that the content of the freedom as 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 individual as personal as apolitical um and the form which is the open society which necessarily requires integration uh integration of the individual integration of all individuals integration of all nations all associations uh, churches uh uh anything mm -hmm. uh, that that could conceivably um i mean we see that we've seen this in the last two years where uh on account of safety all kinds of things have to change about the 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 whole <clears throat> concept of this uh society as we were used to 
uh, as uh, you know, in lines with the new requirements for personal safety, but really the, the public safety of not only you individual, but also your uh, neighbor's cousin's grandmother. Well, if I may, how can you be free if you're not safe? Yes, yes, precisely, precisely. And so uh, appeals to personal freedom or personal responsibility or this sort of thing in the face of this, this looming threat are not intelligible. They don't make sense. They seem petty and, and uh, irresponsible. And so there's a problem uh, because there's no clear indication of where the requirements of the form are going to stop. And there's nothing inherent in the content that is going to um, put any limit on that. Any limits on our safety? Any, y yes, on what, uh, on, on how it's defined and how it's uh, achieved, how it's accomplished. Now, if, if we need to be safe, um, what, what might I ask? Yes, safe from what? Secondly, uh, does that mean that um, that you cannot be free if you're facing danger? Does that mean that danger is bad for freedom and that there is no um, there is no freedom when there is danger? That's the assumption that that life is impossible if your neighbor's cousin's grandma could die tomorrow. You can, you you have to eliminate that threat, or no one can. Okay, no one can... the threat of death. You're suggesting. Yes. Yes. That's a trick. Or... Huh? That's a tricky one, huh? That that is uh, that that is uh, an impasse. It's a puzzle. So, are we escaping death? Oh, have we managed to be safe from death? <clears throat> I I don't know. Have we managed uh, not to be hungry anymore? It's uh, it's not such a simple question as it seems. We. Uh, we have a lot to eat and we live very long, but that doesn't say too much. I, about... I know of some people who try not to go to sleep and stay awake for over 24 hours and 48. What? No, no, I mean, you know, that you, there are situations where- Like I mean, the X-Files. I don't know, but you know, you can think of a student who wants to stay awake, who parties, doesn't go to sleep. Right. The, and he's yeah. trying to stay awake as long as he mm -hmm. can. And mm -hmm. then- um, you know, sooner or later, he's got to go to sleep. Uh, it's not going to work. Well, you know, there's always the next door. With, if that doesn't work with sleep, uh, you know, the, the big one uh, is not going to work. <clears throat> presumably. So, um, all right. So in that case, we have freedom um, understood as... <clears throat> Well, first of all, the question, who is free? Yeah? So freedom uh, understood as incarnated by the individual. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, the meaning of freedom, it can be narrowed down, can be, um, we, can, we can be defined in terms of the individual's self-determination. Huh? Uh, and ultimately, the, the, the dominant rhetoric is that of empowerment. So I am determining myself as an individual in this society uh, of ours that grants me and that uh, defends, at least nominally, my individuality. And so we're taught in schools that we are individuals, that we have to that we have, you know, we have our worth in our self-determination as individuals. And this rhetoric ultimately flows into talk of empowerment. Power, power, power for the, you name it, power for the gays, power for the, 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 the G's, the B's, the, how many letters are in that thing? Um, L, D, yeah. well, B, O, T. Power B -O -T. for all the letters of the alphabet, and then, of course, black power and yellow power and green power and green power is particularly strong. Um, oh, yeah. And, and of course, the bad one is white power, um, yeah. which is uh, almost as bad as or maybe even worse than white powder, um, <laughs> which I understand to be cancerogenic. Um, so 
um, empowerment, I think this whole talk about empowerment goes back to this problem of the, or the rise of the individual. And the notion of individual, as we all know, uh, was borrowed by the moderns from the medievals who referred to God as the individual, the one you can't divide. But in fact, our beautiful individuals today are all divided, are all broken. Um, and so there, there may be divisuals, not individuals, we could say. What does it mean to divide a person? Yeah, well, there are atoms, there are social atoms. This is the mm -hmm. issue. So I am here, the repository of freedom. I choose. What does it mean to choose? You choose. Is it okay? What does it mean to choose? I mean, you know, I choose in a bubble. I choose on my own. Okay. So the will. The yes. Well, I, it's self determination. So on the political platform, what we have is these two main poles, right? We have the what do they call it? The capitalistic society. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, we have the West that stands for the individual, the individuality of people. And so we all have to express ourselves. We all have to determine ourselves and, you know, tread our path. Maybe I want to go to, the, to, to, to Mars. Maybe I want to climb up a, another mountain. Each one of us is an individual climbing his own mountain. Okay? Marco, Marco. You know, I, I follow what you're saying, but it, it, it's, and there's a lot of truth in it, but it's, it's also something of a caricature. It, it, it's be, because is it? The, the, the American idea, the pursuit of happiness. Yes. It's not, is it based on individuality? Well, it, it, the, 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 the idea that happiness was then uh, understood more or less in terms of Greek philosophy. Is that and a matter of individuality? Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that question, but th th it, it's also related to the pursuit of property. And, and we learn from Aristotle that, that certain virtues, for instance, are impossible without property and so private th property there, yes what private property private property and and means riches yes. so, so that the 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 uh the the modern ideal of enlarging the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of property understood in more or less pre-modern terms is, is not a wholly uh, uh, you know, obscene thing. I mean, obviously, it, it, it's, it's now gotten to a point where we're, we're seeing, the, um, we're seeing the, the dark side of it in, on, on a large scale. But that doesn't mean that that the thing in its essence or at its inception was mm -hmm. you know, completely misconceived. Yes, yes. Um, well, um, to that I would say that, um, that in its inception, it has nothing to do with individuality, period. Uh, and that even America is not, as a nation, is not founded on the principle of individuality. As far as private property is concerned, that's a whole different, in a whole different ballpark. Uh, it was, uh, you know, private property. I also have an article that I came up with uh, some time ago. Was it an article or was it a video, perhaps on my channel here, uh, on the uh, Plato on the illusion of, or, or the maybe the illusion or the dream of, of, of privacy? Yeah, that's on YouTube. Yes. Watch that. Yes. Do you remember what that what that was emphasizing? That that is per perhaps it, it is something. Uh, good to cherish, but that is ultimately, if we really ask about its substance, yeah, what, what it's really all about, what is private, yeah? Um, we are hard one, you know, uh, pinpointing what, what, is, what is in fact really private. Um, 
and that in some sense the private is is um you know is to be understood as open to something else okay um but and so not uh, do we still see each other i don't see mm -hmm. okay and and that so that some somehow uh, the private is not absolutely private it's not in a vacuum uh in any case what i would suggest is that um today we have replaced uh, the uh, founding principles of the United States, which were very much uh, in line with classical antiquity, Cicero, Aristotle, and so forth. And we've replaced them with a bogus uh, freedom, which is uh, predicated of, on this individual. And that this individual now has taken the place of um, the human being who is open uh, through dialogue through ethics to divine transcendence. So the, the United States, as far as I'm concerned, is the only modern country that was founded on the, on, on the principle of freedom of religion and not from religion. So positive freedom as opposed to the technocrat, uh, typical European country, think about France, it was founded on, uh, the, you know, through this, uh, the French Revolution, uh, you know, getting rid of the Bible. It's in uh, direct and formal opposition to biblical morality, to the Bible, to the biblical God. That's not the case in the United States, of course. No, no uh, I mean, there was no American Revolution that, that uh, was opposed to the Bible. On the contrary, uh, there was no Robespierre, uh, and no... Uh, well, yeah, but, but you... you in America. In America. You know, one can say that, but to be fair, you have to look at the circumstances in which, in which that revolt against religion occurred. The, the circumstances being the, uh, the 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 extreme corruption of the of the church at that time. That you know, wasn't the, the, the problem. That wasn't the problem. The problem is that, well, that was just an, a, a, an excuse, a pretext. Because uh, you know we had a new aristocracy that you know that that uh, decided that uh, we should take the progressive um, path and trash. Marco, I didn't, I didn't say it was the trash problem. religious authority. I, I'm not saying it was the problem. Hmm. I'm saying that the the church at the at the leading up to the French Revolution was was in a corrupt state, and it was certainly one of the factors that led to the, the anti-clericalism that, that set in in France. The, the, um, the, the prelates, you know, the, 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 the prelates had become exploitive and it was, you know, it was not good. Yeah, but this is just a, um, sort of a, a magnified okay. projection of the real problem. You have, if you go to Machiavelli and Hobbes and so forth, um, you see, you can you can make the same argument, but it's more uh, focused because well, I, you can make what argument that they're responding to uh, despotic theo theocratic. Uh, well, I, it, it, I'm not I'm not exactly saying that the French Re Revolution. Was, I don't. I'm not even saying that the French Revolution was motivated by by the spectacle of of these corrupt aristocrats and prelates. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that. In the context of what happened in the French Revolution, it's understandable that that uh, that, that there was this anti-clericalism going on, given given the other factors. So you, you can't just you you can't just uh, dismiss, and it's a constant problem. You know, human corruption is a constant problem. Yes, so. And, well, it, you can't you can't just dismiss it. You can't talk about these things in 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 abstract absolutes because there's this constant pressure of of the human situation. Uh, 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 Paul, what are these abstract absolutes that you're talking about? Uh, what I said was very specific and concrete. What I said was in the, the United States was founded on a, essentially on a Bible friendly basis. The, the European countries, modern European nations, take France as a perfect example, was were 
founded on an anti-biblical foundation. Okay, they immediately tried to recycle religion. As you know, Robespierre immediately tried to get a civil religion kicking in. And we need God because after all, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau had already warned us. And so they tried to concoct a new religion, but you know, it doesn't go very far. Well, okay, but after the revolution, there was, there was 30 years of restoration and under Charles X, it became very severe. Yes, and, but and it was a struggle. And, 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 and pro-clericalism. So it's not like you know yes. suddenly France became anti-clerical. No, and even course. today. No, but even what? today, nothing. Even today, because well, well, Christianity is they're technocrat government. All right, okay, you can say that, but you you can't just say that that, that France was founded on this thing and bang, you know, this yes. thing happened. Oh, I and do they, say that because the the modern not. I don't. I don't mean to say that they eradicated uh, Christianity. Go to Lyon and you'll see that there is a beautiful church that is dedicated to the martyrs of the resistance. That you know against. The against essentially Christianity, in that case, Catholicism. But obviously there are remnants, obviously there are traces, but essentially these nations- I, I'm, not, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the, the fact the of the restoration of, of three decades of restoration yes. is, it, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like suddenly bang, France became this thing. No, it, because. It, 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 Look at uh, the obviously, there were certain people and the, 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 the Freemasons and blah, 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 who, who were determined and anti-clerical and so on, and they're still at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not completely over and it could swing back another way. I don't think and, so. Well, you don't think so, and I don't know, but look what's happening with Islam. You know, Islam is... is now become this protected precinct in, in, in France. Nobody, you know, you can't say anything against Allah. Uh, you know, everybody respects uh, yeah. Islam. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, at the same know, I, I, I hear, I hear, what you're, I hear what you're saying, but, yeah. but I, I just, I find it a little too black and white. To, oh, yeah, okay. To... Okay. Well, I think maybe, maybe your reading of what I said is too black and white. What I said, and I stand by, and I don't think it's black and white. I think it's a it's a very stark um, distinction that I think is concrete and realistic. Uh, the United States were founded, and of course, and that were not founded in one day. There was a lot of struggle. Obviously, you can go back and forth, but essentially, the, if you look at the Constitution, it is Bible friendly. Okay, there is absolutely nothing that is Bible friendly in the French Constitution, in the Constitution of the European Community, and so forth. They're technocrats. Period. End of the story, as far as I can see. If you want to give me some evidence to the contrary, I'd be glad to receive. Oh, okay, but that's that's that doesn't. There is not a one-to-one -one link between the the founding of France and the revolution. If you want to call that the founding of France, because in a way it was a you know there was a continuation. There's modern not a one -to -one France, link. modern France, of course, not the. All right. Well, there's not. There's still not a one-to-one -one relationship because. Uh, because, for instance, the thirty years of uh, of restoration and and other things, and, so it, you know, and so the, the the European Union is not, and 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 this technocratic monstrosity, which you know your 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 uh, your analysis of which I I I agree, but it's not just a you know one to one relationship with what you're calling the founding of modern France in the French Revolution. It's just not one to one. It's not. It's. Well, I don't know what you, what you mean precisely, because obviously things have been deteriorating or or evolving, as they say. <laughs> so you did not have the EU in 1792 and so forth. But what I'm saying is well, that the, the, the EU wasn't absolutely in, inevitable. You know, Charles de Gaulle was a tremendous influence on France for many, many years. He himself was deeply religious, you know, a churchgoer and and so yeah, on. That's, uh... and, well, okay. I mean, you 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 do sure, but, but that's you, irrelevant. The, uh, you know. Well, okay, it's irrelevant. Then I said nothing. Never mind. No, because it's irrelevant. irrelevant. It's irrelevant, Paul, in the respect that the constitutions of these countries are based on essentially secular. What they understand to be secular. France has had radically secular. Uh, a, a, a dozen, a dozen constitutions since 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 uh, since seventeen eighty nine. It wasn't my intent to get into the the um, 
dynamics of genealogy of the, the modern states. But I, as far as I can tell, it, it's not, um, uh, you know, unfair to characterize the distinction between America and Western uh, European countries in these terms. The new constitution- Except that America is now very anti-religion. Uh, no, 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 wait, wait. I'm talking about the constitutions of these countries. Uh, there could have been, you know, of course there were uh, trials and error. Of course, there are still churches in France. Um, but, you know, these are the vestiges of something that everybody acknowledges to be neutralized. It, they've been neutered. Uh, you know, it, it, they're irrelevant in practical terms. And there is no uh, substantive, no strong, no significant opposition to technocracy. Okay. Um, at the, on the other side, side of the ocean, for whatever reason, we have had um, a country that was founded on principles that were Bible friendly, shall we, put, shall we say. And so there, well, because of that, like I would, respect your mother and father. <laughs> for one thing, but that's not what I, you know, the point is that that the whole political discourse was open to the theological. In Europe, they'll look at you like an alien as a statesman, as a politician, if you bring up a even vaguely res, you know, a resonance, a vague resonance of theological concerns. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't happen in America. It's uncanny watching the, the Christian uh, Democrat or the Christian, I mean, Christian Democrats don't talk about it. One okay, they don't make a vaguest suggestion that they're concerned with this at all. The C is just you know it's it's an acronym of what we, we we're not gonna say. Uh, and then the Christian Union Party, it's it's they they talk about belief. They don't talk you know what what it's about. It's just you know belief is very important for us. Belief. So that's, yeah. Well, it, this is just just like you know, those people who speak about values and they're looking at the, their pocketbook and their in their. This, these are my values. <laughs> yeah, these are my values, right? Uh, it, um, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, one of these games of, you know, I put everything in air quotes, don't say the thing. Mm. Uh, basically. Well, and I think that because of that, and, you know, it can be retraced to that problem. Because of that, it turns out that um, the only nation that I can think of today where you have a somewhat of a battlefield. Uh, so a significant opposition, so a battlefield between the progressive technocratic impulse ultimately means technocratic because it divests uh, politics of any openness to transcendent standards. Uh, so it becomes all about technical politics. Um, and so that the, the battlefield between that position and a strong, significant, virile, uh, if you like, uh, so not neutered, not neutralized, not uh, slavish and immediately subservient to the other side um, position um, is uh, to be found only in the United States, as far as I can tell. Uh, who's winning in the States? You know. You, you know, know who. You know, that's, yeah, well, but at the same time, um, it, it's, it's on the stage. Uh, the, the opposition is not uh, altogether lucid. It is not, you know, there is a conservative, uh, in, in Strauss's terms, a conservative response. And it's usually uh, muddled. It's usually contaminated. So, for instance, uh, you would have these the objection raised by libertarians who again are uh, basing their whole discourse on this individuality, which feeds right into technolo technocracy, although they don't realize it. Um, but there is, there is a space, there is a stage that is re politically relevant uh, for that type of debate. But so in any case, what we do have, what we do have aside from this battlefield, what we do have is on the the international 
scale, yes? Uh, on a broader scale. What we do have very vividly portrayed by the media, I think, are these, this, is, the, is this, um, uh, this, uh, this battle between two positions, which were uh, in fact uh, represented by Thomas Mann, right, in his uh, Magic Mountain. But the two position being individuality, the free market society on the one side, uh, and on the other side, we have, uh, well, this, which some refer to or think of as some very dark, um, in static, uh, shall we say, uh, up, well, certainly it's an opposition, right? Uh, appeal to tradition, to uh, our old ways, and um, shall we say neo-romantic, uh, nostalgic, and despotic. Despot, not free, but anti-liberal anti position. So uh, in, in recent days or weeks, uh, a lot of it has been, of this has been uh, uh, supposedly incarnated by Russia, right? So Russia has served as this um, stage for this position to be voiced out. So here we are, and we don't accept this, this uh, liberalism that in fact is but a mask of imperialism. This other guy says, and he's the, the voice of tradition and of traditional values. The, some people would consider this as a great irony for Putin, uh, the, the heir of Stalin to go to speak against Stalin, to say that America is Stalinistic today with its destruction of traditional family and religion, and that we stand for traditional religion that we are a Christian nation. He does not shy away from that notion. Russia is a Christian nation. We don't accept the demolition of the family. We will integrate nonetheless technology, but we will not accept that demolition of the family and all of this um, gender fluid. Oh. You are. You are you 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 liberals, you fake liberals, imperialists who want to uh, flush this garbage down our throat. We well, don't well, that. why is that imperialism? Which one? Well, this this Western thing. What, oh, because it's why? a pretext. It's the pre you want to sell us. Uh, you want to sell us your freedom. Your freedom is not our freedom. And here's the thing. Uh, it goes but, back to the beginning of our conversation. But 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 but, but wait a minute, Marco. I, yes. Isn't it? Isn't it therefore really religion? Because it's, you know, imperialism all through history has been taking over and administering country. Hold on a second. Yes. Incidentally, the the spokesperson in the spokesperson in, in Russia will say, we're not against freedom. You call us illiberal. We just say that freedom's repository is not the individual, but the collective. I, I, I'm sorry, I had a cat problem there. Okay. But so, you know, okay, let's say the West is trying to push the destruction of marriage and homosexuality and gender fluidity and, and X, Y, Z on everybody. But defining that as imperialism seems to me a, an abuse of the language because it's more like it's, it's more like uh, proselytizing because it's not it's not, no, it's, not that, it's not just that that's just the one of the lines to to show where, where's the where's the imperialism oh the, this party the nafta party is um arguing that the west is um monopolizing the notion of freedom um, well, you know, but th that that's 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 religious talk. Where well, is where is the where is the uh, uh, expanding and taking over? That's all. 
They're where, expanding where are the, and taking over in the name of freedom. This is the same where, thing. They're that, taking over what? It's taking over the morals. The world. It's not. It's not running it. I mean, there's the not, world. There not American governors in in all these different places. You know, it's 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 not imperialism. It's 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 something. Their objection right? is that it's imperialism. Just I, that. Well, okay. You know, they're talking that way, but we can talk more exactly. You know, well, the, there is an imperialist. Calling, everybody's calling everybody a Nazi. Everybody's calling everybody an imperialist. These words don't mean anything anymore. So, so obviously, this, don't there's this Western, Why don't they mean well, anything? You know, if, if you're a Nazi and I'm a Nazi and we're calling each other Nazis, what does it mean? You know, the, how, okay, how can you, how okay. Can First of all, I think it's stupid to, for example, to call uh, Putin uh, um, uh, Hitler. That's not what he's up to. Well, okay, but I mean, but what, on the other hand, it's I'm not saying, stupid. I'm saying it's stupid to call what's going on with the West and America with relation to the rest of the world imperialism. For similar okay, kinds there is of an reasons. element of imperialism, it though. Like the I would British say that Empire. It doesn't look like the Chinese Empire. It doesn't look like the uh, Persian Empire. It doesn't look like the Greek Empire. It doesn't look like the Roman Empire. I disagree. Yeah. It looks very, it very much looks like the Athenian Empire. Where are the governors? Excuse me? Where, where, you know, where, where? It's a corporate Athenian, state. That's the, ludicrous. The Paul, that, wait, Paul, your question is ludicrous. The, the government is, is a corporate government. Is not ludicrous. Yes, the I think Athenians, it's ludicrous. The Athenians obliged the other cities and the islands yes. to produce the ships. They wouldn't have stood for America, you know, the, the, the other NATO countries not even, not contributing their, their even 2%. They wouldn't have stood for that. And they didn't stand for it. The, the you know the the imperialism part of America is so soft as as to not you know I I'm not saying there's nothing going on I'm just saying let's let's Does find Vietnam, more exact language about it. Joachim? is Vietnam soft? Um, Was it imperialism? Well, it's, I mean, it's, the, the, you, you can't you, you know, can't talk. That's the thing. You have been taught, you young people. <laughs> That you have been taught that this is American imperialism. There was something called the Cold War. Look, okay, fine. Yeah, what, what term would you use, Paul? Well, I mean, I, I think to, to begin with, it's, I, I don't know what term, but to begin with, it looks more like a, a religious proselytism, like I said. I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm saying, to me, it looks more like that because it's, it's pushing a moral attitude. It's pushing a metaphysical attitude. It's not. It's not marching in with jackboots and 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 putting governors and obliging and you know. That right. On. That's that's what happened in Iraq. That's what happened in the Middle East. That's what happened in Northern Africa. What they happened in Iraq? They put their, what what, happened, what Iraq? happened? Excuse me, Paul. That's what happened in Ukraine. They don't have their guys. What happened in Iraq? What happened in Iraq? They didn't have their guys set up, or I mean, what what happened in? What about, what about, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what about Iran before with, with the Shah? But I mean, they don't have their own man in there. I mean, this is the standard thing, right? To set up your own guy to to solve the problem. Well, this intervention. All right, all right. Politics, well, look, right? if you're going to call it imperialism, go ahead. I mean, well, it's I not the, I'm not, people. no, first of all, Paul, I am not, the, I am not, wasn't speaking in my, uh, uh, you know, from my standpoint, you know. I wasn't claiming that America is imperialistic or that it's an empire. However, that there is an imperialistic impulse that, um, and let us put it this way, there's a strand of America that is imperialistic. I, I, I would not object to that at all, I, at all. Um, well, there, there's, there's pressure look at what to has make been going on. I'll give you one history. Chris, you, you, let me just say, you're recently in Ukraine, right? Look at the government there. There's Rubio and so forth. They're saying, um, uh, oh no, we have no lab, bio labs in Ukraine. It's, it's a lie. You're a, you have to be a terrorist to insinuate that. We have facilities, they're not labs. Then they started to say, well, yeah, actually, yes, labs. And then, oh, well, but what's, why are we, what's the problem? Why do we have to secure these labs? What's the problem? Well, because there could be dangerous pathogens. Oh. But these dangerous pathogens are not we biological weapons, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. And if they came into the hands of the Russians, and if there were an outburst of uh, 
you know, pathogens, that would be 100% the fault of the Russians, right? Oh, yes, okay. sir. Yes, in government. I mean, what do we what do we have here? We have essentially uh, bio labs that are producing dangerous pathogens, and these labs are controlled by the American government. They're they're sponsored. They're 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 they they throw in the money. Okay, in Ukraine, in a government that, that is tied to a government that has as a great component a Nazi, not even neo-Nazi, but a Nazi. Um, a militant uh, large group, the the government that is uh, has what? as its head, excuse me, that has as its head um, a very, very you know, very uh, what, what, shady what, what makes guy, a very shady guy. Hold on, a very shady guy um, who, um, I mean. I, I'm not going to get into the, the, this. I mean, it, it's it's pathetic. I mean, who has destroyed all opposition? Uh, there's no. He has eliminated all the the political opposition. Um, he's a despot, uh, and of course, the Nazi component is very strong and growing. Um, and you what have, is it? What was that? What is that Nazi component? What do you think it is? I don't think it's anything. They're talking about you know Azov and these Nazis and. Yes. Ukraine, and I, I have no idea what it is. What is it? it? It's just a few people who are playing cards? What is it? What do you think well, it I, is? I don't know. What, what, what are these Nazis? What makes them Nazis? Well, I don't know. Uh, well, That's a question. Right, right. What, what makes a Nazi a Nazi? First of all, aside from the banners and the, and the obvious uh, rhetoric of, that is uh, essentially um, you know, and the, the, and the, the, the hate of the Jew, and this whole standard, um, standard early Nazi rhetoric, you do also have um, a pretty gruesome uh, things going on. Take, I'll give just to give you one example, and then Chris, uh, you, you you were about to say something. I'm sorry. Um, uh, take one example: the the organ uh, harvesting. So you have these factories where they have corpses. Okay. Uh, that uh, and they use uh, apparently, as as my sources uh, have indicated to me, they they use uh, systematically. They've been used using Russian bodies to harvest organs. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, China China does exactly the same thing. Are they Nazis? Uh, look, the Nazis killed um, Chinese. The Maoists killed. What's the difference between a Maoist and a Nazi? You know. I mean, we call them Nazi, I think, primarily because they call themselves Nazi. Okay. Now I could call okay. them I could call them Stalinists, I could call them Maoists, I could call them Pol Potians, but in this particular case, they uh, they they have all of these the paraphernalia and the hate of the Jew that is sort of a staple of the Nazi thing. Do they do commit horrors? Yes. Do other people commit horrors? Yes. <laughs> but this is just a very, and, and the fact that the American government, and not only American government today, but all of these European technocrats, the gang, has portrayed Ukraine as a super democratic country where the president is a new uh, George Washington is simply ludicrous. It's disgusting. It's obviously a farce. The guys know George Washington, the country is no democracy. And they've been bombing regions of their own people um, left and right over the past, what, eight years or so and killing you know, tens of thousands of people. So, I mean, you know, this whole uh, uh, outrage about we have to go save our brothers, help our brothers in Ukraine. Well, up to yesterday, we didn't even know they existed because who, who the hell cares? Or again, the news broadcasters, uh, you know, uh, making people a feel for them by saying, look, these are your brothers, your Ukrainians. They're blonde and blue eyes. You know, they're not like those niggas in, the, in Africa. Yeah, they're bothering you. They have their blonde and blue eyes. So they're your brothers. Go save them. And, and the technocrats say, yes, we have to save them. Let's go sell them some weapons so they can kill each other.
this is a huge farce. And if we don't see this as an as just an element of imperialism, I don't know what you want to call it. Sorry, Chris. Maybe you wanted to interject. Um, not anymore. <laughs> Um, it wasn't meant to be a discussion about that, but I'm just I wanted to point out that there are uh, grounds for the Russian discourse of NAFTA, uh, you know, Setebrini and NAFTA being the two characters in Thomas Mann, you know, this dark conservative uh, uh, and in, in the modern sense, however, the collective. So he's saying, you know, we are for um, for freedom, too. You know, there are grounds for their accusation. Look, you are an imperialist. You are just trying to take over. You have set all of your missiles in our backyard, and we have been begging you to keep those missiles out of the way for the past few years, and you ignored us. You dismissed us. So what do I do? What do I do? You've been bombing our own people, you know, in these eastern Ukrainian regions. So what do we do? We intervene. We take that as an opportunity to intervene. It, it's not irrational. It's not absurd as a discourse. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, what do they say? That we're against freedom? No, they don't say that. They say we are for freedom. The only thing is that we don't conceive of as freedom, of freedom as um, grounded in the individual. We conceive of freedom as grounded in the collective. And then they will add that from the beginning of time, Christianity has all been about that. Now, I think that's a complete farce, too, because it's not about collectivism, tradition. You know, this is a Marxist recycling, you know, it's standard Marxist stuff. You know, communists, uh, okay, it's the collective that dominates. It's the same crap that they say in China, they've been saying all along. You know, we have, and look at their Chinese films, it's all about the collective, right? The law, many actors, it's all, it's the movement of the collectivity. You know? But in fact, this is a false dichotomy, I would argue. The dichotomy between, as, as Joachim, as I think is what he said, uh, brings out, brings to light, the, the, the collective is not the opposite of the individual, because the collective is simply the consummation of the individual. The individual uh, is invited to express, to self-determine himself, and then he realizes, of course, in the process of self-determination, that he is building a new collectivity, a collectivity of individuals. So they praise freedom, uh, but this freedom ultimately has to um, flow and realize itself in the collective. So and it's this a credit is, this is Hegelian. This is Hegelian. You can take the leftist Hegelian or the right, right Italian, you know, as they used to say, maybe they still do, but ultimately it's the same pot that you're going into. Joachim, sorry. I said the... Uh... Bring it up. Yeah. You're not coming through, Yoko. Oh, oh no. You're frozen. Oh, maybe I should head back. You're back. Into, You're back. You're head back. back into the living room. Yeah, I'm back. I, I, I said it's the predicate of the collective. This freedom is predicated on the collective. It turns out. Turns out. And, and you see this in the West too. The the, the land of the individuality, yeah. where now, as you, in Western Europe too, now this individual freedom becomes a sin. You are being selfish. Yeah. You're selfish, right? Yeah. And uh, it has a geopolitical, if you would like that word, <laughs> correlative to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And we now, we have an army, an intervention force, European intervention. Yes. They've been, trying, they've been trying to convince people to get this organized. Yeah. Now we have a great, great reason to do it. We have to build up the European army. And we yep. have to go and sell our weapons, great investment. Italy is, I think, is the seventh country in the world in terms of production of weapons. I mean, you know, it's, it's a wreck mm -hmm. as a country, but it's, it, it has yep. so much for great production of weapons. And, and you know, it's, that's fantastic. You say, well, you know, that was thanks to the United States. And they're okay, but what is the alter what, what was the alternative? The United States has been involved in Italian politics ever since the Second World War. 
but you know, trying to keep the Soviets out. And at the same time, it was supporting the mafia and the development of the mafia. And so you had all of this great stuff going on in Italy for so many decades that was supported by the CIA. Um, you know, it, it's a very dirty situation. And of course, it was all in the name of keeping the Soviets out which had its justification. But now I think that to get back to the problem of freedom, the main problem here is that we have, in my understanding, a false dichotomy. Here it is, right? The, the one I just, we just talked about. Yeah. The individual and the collective. They're both farces. Is there an alternative? You know, is the, this individual, of course, is a secular, essentially secular. He can have, a, a, a romanticized religion attached to it, you can add that to the to to his DNA. You can add it to the molecule, like a little tail, molecular tail there. But essentially, he's con constituted in a secular context. He understands himself in history, right? Perhaps he might uh, he might uh, attach that little tail to bridge the gap in in terms of social cohesion. It's. It feels good. It feels it feels good, and you know, <laughs> the social cohesion, cohesion. So that's cohesion between you gotta individuals. Do something on Sunday, like, huh? You got to do something on Sunday. That's 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 exactly right. You can't have you can't have a soccer match every Sunday. <laughs> oh, and uh, look at how many people are going to church. I mean, this. I mean, what am I saying? Something new. Um, you say, well, um, Paul, well, well, look at all the Islam that we have. Are, aren't they then pro-religion? I don't know about that. The point about bringing the, the Muslims was to re-educate them so that then they can convert. You know, the, the, the Muslims are not in France only because somebody wanted to re-educate Muslims. Why did they bring they, them they, in they, in mass? Why did they bring they, them in they, in mass? They... they, they some were brought in, others came in of their own accord. But it's the same and, thing in England. And, 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 and the motivations, the motivations for those who favor um, uh, immigration are, are multiple. So there, there's cynical reasons, there's wrong-headed humanitarian reasons. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kaleidoscopic. And yes, I'm, no, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to contradict you. I'm just... Okay. No, I'm no, trying no. to point out that, that it, 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 you know, that, that, there, that there are these other aspects that I think it's important not to forget. And so the fact is that in France, Islam is respected. And I'm not saying that that means that France has turned around and it's no longer blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying it's a fact. It's a massive fact that's going on in France now, Islam is respected. Well, and heresy, it's respected. Is, <laughs> heresy against Islam is punished. Yes, well, and so that, that's, that's just a fact. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a total game changer, but it's, it's something that's going on that you can't simply wave away. Well, the, the fact that the, that the government is defending the rights of Muslims, I think, is based on a very simple principle and consideration. And that's not love of Muslims. That's simple. I never said that. I never right. said that. But it's a fact. It's a social so, fact. Yes, 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 yes. It, 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 Islam, <laughs> Islam is getting respect. It's getting respect because it's feared. And it gets a lot of... Uh, it gets a lot of, uh, you know, nicey nice talk yes. in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the public square. And those things have an effect. And it's, it, it's, it's having various effects on the, the Christians in France. And it, in a certain way, it intimidates them. And in another way, it emboldens them. So these are things that are going yes. on. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it, it's not just like uh, you know, absolutely no religion. So, so no, in, in no, certain... no, I didn't say that there's absolutely no religion. Well, I know you didn't, but yeah. uh, the point is that there, there, there are still aspects of French society which are, uh, you know, which which are de determined by by religious things. 
Yeah, it seems to me that those aspects have nothing to do with government, though. Well, all right, okay, all right, blow it off. Okay, it's, no, it's all it's all simple and clear and clean. Yeah, I don't think it so. is. It, 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 there's there's a bunch of technocrats up there, and uh, it's pathetic. Of course, the technocrats are coming down like a ton of bricks. Right, they're coming down like a ton of bricks, but they're meeting opposition also. And 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 as a result, as a result, the the, the 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 social situation is becoming more and more chaotic. It's not like they're it's not like they're getting it's not like they're getting their way a hundred percent. They're pushing very hard. Right. But by pushing hard, two things are happening: the opposition grows, and chaos is coming in because of these things. I'm yeah, not I, saying I, that they, I'm not saying that they're uh, not going to win. Okay. Okay. I'm not saying they're not going to win. Right. I'm just saying that, that, that there's not a clear path in front of them, okay. and I, I don't think uh, okay, I don't think I things are going to go the way they want. It's, I don't think, it, it, okay. I don't think, Paul. However, that the opposition is religious. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying the opposition is religious. I'm, well, I'm that's the whole point. The, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Because in the United States, the opposition is religious. Okay. Some of the opposition in France is religious. Some of it is. The significant opposition is religious. And this is the same problem that Dostoevsky highlighted, right? As long as the opposition is not religious. Some, some, of, the some of the opposition is religious. Some of it is. I, I think it's completely. And, 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 some, and there's opposition in America, which is not religious. Too. Yeah, but I think this is whitewashing. Uh, because the main opposition, and it is significant in America, is religious. The main opposition the one that is significant in Europe, I don't see as being religious. I mean, frankly, I mean, I, you, know, you, no, could, you could think about some European country, you know, Hungary, where the where there has some appeal to Christianity, but that has that's a farce. That's a banner for for what? Uh, you know? of Poland or something. Yeah, well, you know, it's Polish, Polish Catholics. Well, um, look, Paul, don't, don't you make this point yourself that 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 conservatives quote unquote are, are yesteryear's liberals is is is, is that not uh, I, you know not, i i i'm i'm uh i've given a, up using those terms long ago because i don't think they mean anything well because of that right <laughs> among well, well, other sure, sure i mean I, to, to me to something. me 90 90 90 percent of the whole world the whole world from america to china and in between is what i call neo-nazi <laughs> because because everything everything is based on race and every you know yeah. and 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 uh you know the 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 search for power and so on i mean i, I you know i'm i'm in i i think i'm in basic agreement with you marco about these things i just i just don't think it's so clean and it, it you know it, and it's okay to, to talk about it a little bit in the, in those terms but you know, I'm just, you know, it's... Um, I do think that there's something fundamental, uh, a fundamental distinction that is worthwhile uh, maintaining, both uh, exoterically and esoterically, as it were. So it's something real about the foundation of the United States as opposed to the foundation of modern European countries, and other countries for that matter. But the, Well, the you, know, you can say that. You can say that, and okay. But once you've said that, then you've got to look at other things. I mean, uh, uh, the the religiosity of American of of America in a certain way has always been has always been rather superficial compared to the, you know, uh, American Catholics are not what French 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 Catholics are, or you know, let's say thirty years ago. They're they're viewed with American some Catholics were not like French Catholics. So, uh, and and American Protestants, you know. There, there's a lot. There's a lot of nuance in the thing. Uh, yes, America it does not. America, yeah, but this does not cancel the crucial point that politics is open to the theological, whereas in Europe it's been essentially, effectively, in practical terms, except that, except that except that politics has become basically theological from a certain point of view. In Europe? Because it's become all about morals. Oh, it, this is the, the, the these are the morals of Disneyland. They're the rules. Oh, okay, okay. The regulation. It's, it's, it's still it's still structured. It's still structured. You can't that get way. away from you can't sure Paul you you can't get away from the vestiges of morality. 
there is a new morality is the morality of technocracy but that you know this well, it's, it's, it's not a vestige of morality it's a kind of morality yes okay but i mean traditional morality it, this is a, a free-floating uh, uh discourse that changes all the time it's it, it nobody cherishes it as sacred it's just the the you know it, it's what it is today and tomorrow or whatever yeah, I'm but, questioning but, the but course that, of this discourse. That very changeableness yeah. of the sacred quality. I've talked about this a lot in these last few years. But I know I'm not. You know, obviously it's 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 non-Christian, but it's uh, it's it's like a it's like a a farce of Christianity. I I see I see something to what you're saying, Paul. That in in the sense that you can call it theological, and people do in the sense that they're. Uh, that there are suspicions, implications of of very deep disagreements, uh, in the sense that, uh, or 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 in the in the form of uh, suspicion that there are that there is a misunderstanding between the parties, uh, between the the sort of the new opposition also in Europe and the establishment and its sympathizers and adjacents that. Uh, that there's a gap that that's not bridgeable by language, and that uh, people have fundamentally differing uh, suppositions. There's a suspicion of the theological in that. However, on the other hand, also ask the question: What is left for the opposition to hold on to in Europe versus America? I think that's the question Marco's asking. If I'm if I'm interpreting correctly, uh, the, if I look in the Netherlands, um, the opposition used to be uh, you know the party for freedom it's not exactly <laughs> a very rich uh uh theological political history or uh intellectual girdle to it shall we say uh and now the the most recent iteration is based on roger scruton uh cherry baudet is a disciple of roger scruton uh, with this whole high culture business and uh which he then goes on to not talk about even uh, publicly so much uh, uh, so especially in the last two three years uh, not not too much of that even um, so you get a discourse that's rather hollow and there's not really too many places to go there um, what I do think is that the establishment with its um, aspirations is speaking theologically sometimes uh, and most uh, in, in in its most popular form, this is this this the the climate rhetoric has some very. Oh, well, maybe this is merely on the level of terms, but of course the terms are supposed to mean something. Uh, with you know a, a sort of ap apocalyptic environmentalist rhetoric. It, yes, yes, that which which has both the the human element and you know the. The, let's say the super slash subhuman element, right? The climate is the theological direction. Kind of the, new religion. Um, uh, whereas I was saying that the opposition is really, um, you could say from a, from a kind of an anti-theological quote unquote impulse, uh, cutting off that kind of discussion, perhaps in speaking of values and going back to uh, some semblance of traditional morality, it's getting theological, but not explicitly, uh, not not here anyway. They're very implicit uh, and not wanting to um, to repeat the situation with the the climate thing, uh, with the kind of authority it has and the kind of uh, forces it mobilizes. Um, but but this is this is the this is the um, this the, the super political uh source of authority in our situation this is fear that we have that you know it's all the whole show is going to come to an end yeah but this is all part of the immanentistic uh, uh, hey, rhetoric yeah. so to call it you know uh, uh the religion <laughs> of the market uh, or to call it you know to give to give uh, these um these discourses a theological import is a manner of speech you understand yes. that it's a matter of speech. What, what does it mean? What does it mean to, to speak about theology, the theological? Well, it means that there has to be a, a, a supra-political 
a superhuman, a super immanent uh, yes. uh, uh, dimension and set of concerns. So you're not going to be afraid of, fe you know, the fear of death or death in itself. Death is going to be a big question. You're worried about not death per se, uh, which is to say dying, uh, but about the meaning of death. So the content of death. That is the theological, the content, the significance, the meaning of death. And so there is no such thing in the Machiavellian, uh, neo-Machiavellian, you name it, uh, discourse of these governments. There's no such thing. We stop at death. <laughs> this is the problem. We have to escape from death. And, um, and we find all kinds of discourses to escape from death. But that's not, you know. The closest we have is, of course, that this, even this, this pseudo theological, if you like, discourse of the climate crisis and this other crisis and that other crisis, whatever crisis cycle we're in, um, is coming from um, an avowedly disinterested scientific discourse that's uh, supposed to be free from fear, um, supposed to be. If, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's supposed to be, but you see how well it, it, it feeds into it, because as soon as you define the human being as a piece of meat, obviously the human being, the human mind that sees itself as a piece of meat is going to shit in its pants. Um, yeah. Because what am I going to do? I'm going to be scared. I'm just a piece of meat. And you talk right. about the farce of Christianity. You know, you have this old talk about Christianity calling us sinful uh, and uh, threatening the flames of hell and, and you know, and putting it in, in a little corner. And this is, <laughs> this is what they're doing, what they are doing. Put on your hands. Yeah. This is what they're doing by defining you as a piece of meat. And these so-called yeah. scientists, so-called scientists, and get bring in those hefty, thick scare quotes <laughs> scientists are telling you that you're a piece of meat and people are bowing to their authority which they corroborate with the evidence that they gather in their labs and they're telling you <laughs> that they are right because they are authoritative because they are right and so forth and so on there goes the circus and you believe them because they tell you you're a piece of meat and as a piece well, of meat, me. you, you are a piece of meat. <laughs> you want a piece of meat? And you want the proof? The proof they tell you is in the pudding, and they start chopping you up. So, well, so, so at, at least there's a few of us that don't believe it. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, we're getting chopped up nonetheless. But still, okay. They have, we've talked about, we had that session with on the individual. So the individual, wonderful is the repository of freedom. Well, what happened before the, the, they came up with a so-called individual? Before they invented the individual? What was the human being before then? Well, he was not the repository, the, the pure Cartesian uh, bubble, value-free repository, and, and cut off from the theological, of course. Of course, you can add the tail, but he's basically cut off. Um, repository of freedom. Where is freedom? It's in the individual. What, a, what about outside of the individual? <gasps> no freedom. Therefore, hurry up and get, get into the bubble of the individuality that we're there to sell you. Because outside, there's no salvation. So, but then it turns out that this bubble of individuality meets another bubble and another one and another one. And they're fighting against each other and they figure the only way to solve this problem is to build a super bubble, the collective based on the in little bubbles. And so finally we have to empty out our individuality in this great communality, the, the fundamental. And now what happened now? <gasps> We're shocked, technocracy. And how do we rebel to it? The libertarian says, they have, uh, they have uh, betrayed our individual freedom. So rewind. But don't you see that this technocracy did not come out of, you know, ex machina or, or it, it was not 
is something that evolved in parallel in from a parallel universe that that it is actually the result the rise of technocracy is the result of the unfolding of the individualist dream this is i think key the key to our understanding this ludicrous debate that we have between the the settembrini and nafta between the the upholders of the, the libertine upholders are usually of the individuality of the individual freedom the freedom of the individual and on the other hand the ones who say no it is the collective that is really free but Mar marco what was there before there was the individual chris what do you think was there <laughs> El <Fire>. nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> there's always been the individual it's always ah yeah. ah so you get people like eric Fromm, for example to to speak in vulgar terms uh about vulgar people <laughs> um, marco why don't you why don't you who tell says, us you know from the, in the first century they invented the individuality so oh. and, and and this is freedom because there's no freedom outside of it so but, what is this so what was there before um something like human beings <laughs> well, there were there were there were single human beings. Uh, and how uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, they were married and singles. Yeah, both singles, doubles, a package deal. Oh, the point is very simple. There were no Cartesian individuals. So what happens there as a human being? I well, what, am... was the, what was the word? Right. I mean, a person. Oh, oh, oh so a a human beings, person. citizens, people, human beings. Mortals, bring it on, but yeah, not yeah. individuals. And why? Is it just semantics here? Are we playing games with words? Absolutely not. Because the individual is a Cartesian ego. What happens to the Cartesian ego? E e e e ego, the, the ego. Well, he is constituted independently of theological concerns. In fact, it's just an appendix, you know, to support, to prop him up later you know, yeah, yeah, stuff later. goes on top you know it's okay but basically he's constituted in a vacuum because of his emptiness formal infinite emptiness formal nominal he has to be filled with the powers of the world but you know we don't have to get into the dynamics of the well, you know uh, marco marco that's fine so but it, i would feel much more comfortable if you if you called this thing the cartesian individual because using the word individual like that's that. That's what it is. Well, okay, but you know, I I I, I prefer it if you really explain that uh, philologically, because No, but you, you know, see, it, Paul, that's not yeah, fair. You know, you're, you're making a quick, you know, it, like that word for you is coeval with this Cartesian individual thing. And it's very confusing. It's been very confusing for me. Mm. And even I, I, yeah, insulting, I think I know why it's confusing, because um, and by the way, coeval can mean two different things, right? Um, I'm, <laughs> co -evil, yeah. um, but uh, it, uh, you, you can still see, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it is, it can be confusing because we usually speak of the individual as, as something that is, um, uh, not what is the term in academia, not problematic. In other words, we think that we don't think of it as born of the Cartesian discourse um you don't marco think i'm willing i'm willing to think about it the way you want me to think about it i would just like it to be explained that's all uh, I mean, you know, you know all right you're you're uh you're you're proposing this but it, it's uh it's been very confusing for me i'm okay. just warning you okay I mean, I used the word, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I used the word individual and you jumped on me and, and informed me that all my thinking was, 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 was modernist and I didn't know what I was talking about. You yeah. know, it's, uh, Chris? It's, it's, not, it's not a way to proceed. Um, well, I mean, the use of the word individual, it's maybe part of it is semantical. It's, it seems to me that, <laughs> that, use of the terms like individual allows you to do kind of calculus on society it's it you know it becomes yet another part of i mean was, was was that word never used in the 
in the early 18th century? Was I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I don't know if it was never used, but it's the but the, but I mean, the prevalent. The prevalent. By 17th, that's modern. modern. That's modern, Paul. Why do you say 17th century? That's still modern. I said Descartes. Descartes. Why? Why, why don't you ask if it was not? Okay, used? then this the is yeah. Descartes. Was it, I mean, well, I mean, I the, know, was the word like the, never used? The, the, key, the key point well, is that individual, among all the terms you could use to describe a, a, a walking, talking, breathing biped. Shooting. Right, shooting biped. Individual is, you know, maybe we'll come up with something even even more. Well, the, the Cartesian neutered. Individual. I mean, the, that, you know, the then, then it's clear what. what it's just, what, it's, what, a, it's a, it's a what, sort of like, discussed. it's almost a scientific term to describe. Well, okay, but then you have right. to explain and, that before well, you before you jump on somebody for using such a term. And, well, and, I'm not, and, I'm not, and, I'm not jumping. I'm not talking this. about you. I'm talking about yeah. Marco. And no, excuse so, me, Paul. Excuse me, Paul. Sorry, Chris, too. But since he mentions that, I, I think that's that's not correct. I didn't jump on you for on, in terms of semantics because there was a whole discourse that was based on the notion of uh, the individual climbing the mountain of truth. So. Uh, that, that's not a matter of one word in a vacuum. Okay, okay. It's a whole so way I've, got, of I've, got the human course, I've got all these videos in which I use the word individual, and it's all blanket condemned because that word means blah blah. No, because, again, I'm know, not taking it out of context. It's the it's the discourse of individuality. That is what is not. Well, we we all we, you can't you can't help using the word, and it doesn't really. I can, but well, hey. maybe you can, or you know. If you slip one day and you accidentally use it, it's, it's not the point. It's, no, that's not the point. The point is it's it's part of a larger vocabulary, a modern vocabulary, which would have sounded Discord. to to a, it's would have sounded to someone from. No, any word is fine as, as long as the very, thing is explained and one understand yeah. what's one understand sure. what the rules are. We you are know? X Men. You, you got to explain the rules. We're X Men. <laughs> but if you speak Which about the X Men, but if you speak about the X Men uh, as People speak about individuals. I don't care if it's you call it X Man, Peanut, uh, individual. It boils down to the same thing. It just the, the only, the are only you saying I can pick what my pronouns are. Uh, I think the only I mean the, the uh, I use uh, perhaps in highlighting the word individual is it's a it's a de theolo a de theologized term. Yes. For a person, you know. Yes. Yes. Cut it's, off. It's from it's her. it's a way of, it's you know maybe a, a one of many ways of of vacating modern discourse of the theological because as soon as you say man or woman, you well you then you have something gendered and you have something that you know has a sort of distant <laughs> distant distant biblical resonance. But even even that distant resonance, you know, has has to be done away with. It seems to me, and and the other the other point is being some, the thing we already said that that it's it's a term of empowerment. On the one hand, you are you are an individual. It's it's you know you can be the the scientist who is who is performing your own experiments on your own you know freedom acquisition. Um, but it's it's also it's a way of making people into unit cells that can then become incorporated into a larger body politic, which is monstrous when one gets a sky eye view of, of the thing. But um, but from the granular perspective, but you know, so in, in any case, you know, inducting people, inducting the the innocent youth and everyone into into this modern way of talking because it's because it's the most inoffensive way of describing people right as individuals it's neutral. it's the way to, it's 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 yeah it's gray gray neutral and and that's it's just indicative it's 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 indicative of a lot of the larger way that the wind is blowing in, in, in that you know the the end game here is is to incorporate everybody into into a great society where everyone is free everyone has the the free use of their freedom to be free right um but at the cost of 
meaning. Any kind of meaning of that freedom. <laughs> it doesn't so, mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. So there's a, there's a one-to-one correspondence between the Cartesian individual and technocracy. I don't know if there's a one-to-one correspondence, um, yeah. but, but um, I think if they could use a more neutered term, they'd use it. Well, well, um, I, you know, however you understand this one, one-to-one, um, is there a straight line that you can draw from uh, Descartes, or rather Machiavelli to technocracy? And, and then, um, you know, uh, it, it's bumpy, it's a bumpy road, it's a bumpy road, but yes, yes, I would say yes, and it can be shown um, that um, you know to the extent that we have uh, the the individual, this leads to the society of individuals, which necessarily um, is is characterized by the disappearance uh, slash death of God, which means the disappearance of man, and so. God and man, the theological and the ethical properly understood, disappear, and you end up with this technical society. But a yeah. technical society is not just a society of techne in the ancient sense. It is a society that defines I- its own ends. So it's a technological society. Technology is not a mere tool. This is extremely important here. It is not a mere tool. Technology is a way of life. It's a way of speaking. Well, then, then you need, then, then, you know, also of speaking, also the technological speech, which is, which is this discourse, of course, of course, but it, it, that discourse is that also that way of life. It's the whole yeah. orientation of life. Speech becomes something cut off from humanity and uh, divinity. It, it is right, so, so, yeah, the, well, things that I mean. So, um, the most interesting, or one of the most interesting parts of your discourse, Marco, has been getting back to the the poetic basis of 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 well, the poetic basis of everything in a way. That whenever you try to de- define a word, say like individual or any any word, at best you can you ha- you have to give a poetic explanation, which necessarily leads into a philosophical explanation, because you know, um, it, how, how can I describe anything except, except poetically? But, but in the new society, the, the goal is to render everything as data, that is something that, that can, it is controllable and predictable Information. And, and thus is voided of the poetic, that is voided of human agency in, in exercising the poetic and philosophical dimension of speech, because where there is philosophy and where there is poetry, there is questioning, and there is the indeterminate. And you know, and and so the goal is to have the wheels and the gears all nice and greased. Well, to, you know. is, is is that the solution, Marco? Uh, the 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 greased wheels. What, what Chris just said. The cogs? A solution to what? To this situation. This technology individual. Well, it, it, it is the, the, the coming of age. It is the result of the... This, this is that... that yeah, but how do we get out of it? Ah, how do you get out of, techno- how do, of the technological cave? <laughs> well... Any any suggestion? Any proposal? Well, yeah. practically, we don't. Never, we'll never get out, um, because to try to get out now is tantamount to disarming, which means you get taken over by the rest of the technology guys. Yeah, it's it's never going away unless it all goes away at once, which is possible but unlikely. You're People will try about again. Whole nations. You're speaking about you know, whole nations converting yeah. to a uh, okay. Yeah, all of us. You know, because uh, yeah. if, if one nation is going to convert, that means all of them have to, or that one nation is just going to get eaten up by the other people who can't, you know, stand it or see an opportunity for resources, whatever, whatever it is. Okay. Uh, well, um, 
th this this article that I'll, I'm coming up with here. Uh, I, I don't know when they'll publish it uh, on the nature of context uh, beyond secularism. That addresses th this issue. I think I have at some point in, in other articles. But you know, politically, there is an alternative. There is an alternative, um, and I try to articulate what that means. Um, you know, you, me, as human beings, how are we to live? Uh, is there an alternative for us as human beings? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Purge your life of the technocratic compulsions. How do you purge yourself? Well, purgation is poetry, poetry is purgation. Um, so, um, expose yourself to that which is not individuality. Oh my goodness, but out of my individual bubble, don't forget that you are stuck in an individual bubble. You are not the individual. Outside of my individual hut, my bubble, there is hell. You know, the Herculean pillars, if you pass by them and you go beyond them, you fall. No. That is what they have told you. That is what you have been raised to believe. No, there may very well be genuine freedom outside of the bubble of individuality. So as far as the human being that the human beings that we are is concerned, we can step out of that bubble, dare to step out, and discover ourselves outside of that bubble and realize, hey, this is life, not what I was, what I believed to be in when I was still stuck inside this bubble of the individual and dreaming of all these things about truth, about this, about God, but still within the bubble of individuality. Now I step out. And every time somebody tries to stick me back in, even if only surreptitiously, you know, and I say, no, you're not getting me back into that bubble. I am stepping out. Oh, but that's dangerous. You bet it is. And that's where it gets fun. When it's dangerous, that's when I start living. So, can we, Joachim, step out? You bet we can. Does it take a bit of an effort? Yeah. For one thing, you have to expose yourself. Oh, you pervert. Oh, you selfish bastard. Well, call me what you want, but I'm going to expose myself to everything that that individual bubble had barred me from, namely the naked man and the naked God the naked dangerous man and the naked dangerous god not the little mickey mouse donald duck god that they're telling me about as long as i'm in the bubble i want the dangerous god and the dangerous man that's where i meet him outside of that bubble and if that means that i'm gonna get in trouble so be it what the hell we're mortals aren't we not but that's where i discover both God and man outside of the bubble. As far as politics is concerned, I think there are intelligent models, and I'm referring to what I'm what I'm, what I'm referring to in this article in context, the nature of context, as the Hebrew model. They think they think is is uh, essential for the recovery of of well, for, as far as I'm concerned, America is the place where recovery can take place. I don't know about elsewhere, but first of all here, and I would say that that's the only model that can save America. I've done some, maybe some articles. In, in that case, American imperialism would save the world. No, on the contrary, because there is a different America, which is not the progressive technocratic uh, Disney uh, producing But if the America. good America takes over, then American imperialism will be good. Say that again. Although that, that was Rome. If the good America takes over, then American imperialism would be good. Yeah, no, it's no, precisely because the good America is not going around, uh, you know, 
teaching, you know, um, selling democracy, selling freedom. The good America is staying home. The good America is strong and represents a beacon of freedom, a beacon of home, uh, of hope, and a model for other nations. If you want to, if you nation want to come along and speak to me, and be open to me, you have to know what I stand for. I'm not standing for individual bullshit. I stand for the real God and the real man. So this if you is why like you call that, it the Hebrew talk. model. If you don't like that, you know. I'm not going to try to sell you freedom. I'm going to try to help the guy who, who you know, if there's a guy who asks me, please help. Ah, yeah, okay. It, we have to see how that plays out, but not on technocratic terms. Yes, yeah, sorry, Yoki. So this, this is why you call it the Hebrew model. Yes. It's a beacon. It's a model for others if they yes. want help. They a can nation ask for among nations. A nation, yeah. which is what I would submit to you, is what America was originally. A nation among nations. Yeah. The beacon is not there to sell freedom, to turn everybody into a, you know this huge market of freedom. It is there to be concerned primarily with domestic affairs, not with international affairs. Domestic law not international law doesn't exist it's a farce it's a farce there's no such yeah. thing as international law that's part of technocracy part of the whole modern bubble what do you have instead well international law is a farce you know is war that's all it's just a cover-up for war so what do you how do you deal with war well you either have science dealing with it or the art of war now they've recycled, I know in some quarters, the term, the art of war, but they really mean the science of war. Fine. Well, th this is the distinction. You get rid of the science of war, what do you, you what do you have left? The art of war. Well, what do you say? Well, Joachim, you say, well, we got all these weapons, we have all this technology, all these computers, what do we do with it? Well, of course, we're gonna still need to keep these machines, but free ourselves at this point. Will the world ever be able to free itself from these machines? Very unlikely. However, right. however, to the extent, there is an extent to which you can free yourself from the machines. Certainly. Reduce, reduce in your life the reliance on machines. Purge yourself, purge yourself of this orientation of life and understand that the openness to the dangerous man and the dangerous God is the best, most profitable way of living. Injustice is not more profitable than justice. Oh, but then we're all going to die because the, the, the foreign technocrats will get bigger bombs than us. Well, you know what? So be it. You want to have bombs, let's have bombs. But let's at the same time be honorable because if you lose your honor, What's the point in having the bigger bombs? What's the point in winning if you have become in the process a devil? So I say, what's the difference between, you know, America and its nemesis? Well, America is, is just as bad as its nemesis if it forgets, if it forgets honor. So with the war against viruses, the virus, the new virus is the macroscopic. The old virus is the microscopic. The microscopic war, the war on the microscopic virus was nothing more, nothing less than preparation for the war on the macroscopic. It was all tied, it all ties in. It is not a coincidence that the discourse shifted from one to another. It is obviously pathetically, uh, you know, um, what do you, you can expect it, you know, it, it's, it's a script that it's, you know, you know what they're going to say. It's no surprise. From the beginning of the circles, I was saying, you know, this is just a preparation for the war against the macroscopic uh, virus. That's all. So we're heading into endless war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it started with the sanctions of China. <laughs> 
pro provoking them. You, you, because you go against uh, human rights. The hell is that? They've been torturing Tibetans for years. What's the big deal? What's new? Oh, but now you're supporting Russia. But we're not going to say we're going to sanction you because you're supporting Russia. The farce. We're going to say that we're sanctioning you because because we are we stand for human rights and you're not kind people in China, you know? And the Chinese authorities are pissed and they say we're going to retaliate and this can escalate and we're going to have a juicy World War III, a hot one. So <laughs> what what are we doing? What are we doing? This is a far Now, America has been obviously the government on Washington has been occupied by these technocrats but there is a hot war within the united states that is politically significant politically relevant it's hot and the opposition is still standing and however it needs to be uh less prudish about where it stands it needs to purge itself of its enemy if you understand what I mean, it, it, it yeah. needs to reconsider itself independently of everything that it's fighting against. Go to its roots. Down to its roots. You can't fight the enemy if you're on standing on the same grounds. Not successfully. You can't. You know. You can. You're not going to achieve anything good. So we need groundwork. We need to. Uh, we need, for one thing, a discourse that helps us step out of that bubble, uh, the Cartesian bubble, and recognize ourselves as dangerous human beings. And what's his name there? Peterson. He's a Kantian. The, the, you know, there are elements. There are elements in his discourse where he did get it right. Although then, when you scratch the surface of that discourse, and you start seeing that it's you know, that, that it's made in China. But you, know, <laughs> you scratch this, the, the, the little film there and you say, ah, but the fact that he is inviting people to be, uh, you know, dangerous, that's perfectly legitimate and perfectly meaningful. Yes, but we also need to get the dangerous God because if you just get me, give me the dangerous man, it becomes a farce without the dangerous God. And, you know, he, he, his dangerous man is Kant, but Kant ain't going nowhere without, you know, he's just going the same, he's just repeating the same trajectory, you know, the same journey that leads to technocracy. He's a tractate whose logos is always the same. <laughs> we're not, we're not going anywhere. It's, it's just repetition. Um, we need to step out of it. Otherwise, what was this film or something like a film that they had in recent times where they, these, these guys, kids, I don't know, they, they're repeating, they're living the same day over and over and over. Groundhog Day. Is that what it's called? I, there's a movie like that, uh, that set that trope, as people call it now, that set up that, yeah. that kind of story. It's, it's called Groundhog Day. It's about a guy... I don't know, he's on a cruise or something. He's living the same three days over and over again. It must be different versions. The, the, the one ripped, that yeah. I saw was, uh, had uh, as its message, the, 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 the possibility of uh, stepping out of that loop. Yeah. And, the, the, you know, you're repeating the loop as long as you, you're not a good boy. If you mm -hmm. keep being bad, you just repeat that that cycle but yeah. so if you purge yourself of evil <laughs> of sin or whatever you want to call it uh then you you step out of it and then you're out of the loop and in mm -hmm. some respect we are all trapped as a civilization in this loop of individuality and this i've, I've referred to the loop in other contexts of prog the progressive life that is not going anywhere but this infinite progress of denial of death uh, which also which means denial of of God because you know you of immortality. Uh, the, you know those who have, for example, in the 60s, 70s, who have um, uh, uh, protested against the the denial of death, were were were, were saying that uh, it is it is the love of immortality that that is the consummate 
sign of the denial of death. On the contrary, on the contrary, the denial of death is the result of the denial of immortality, just as the denial of man is the denial of God. It comes from there. Once you deny God, man is out. He's a piece of meat. So you can you can butter it up and say, well, but he has a, a you know a, a transcendental structure. <laughs> but then ultimately, you know, he is reduced to genealogy. And this is what they're doing. You they reduce you to your genealogy. Right. <laughs> so. You can you can uh, decorate the genealogy with your with your stru conceptual structures, but basically you're genealogically reduced. <laughs> your DNA it's all about you know manipulation of the genealogy. You know, talk about denial of death. Genealogy. Can we escape the bubble? What Make if they're outside of the bubble? Is it safe outside? Uh, does it matter? Probably, probably not. Probably not. I don't know. I but, feel like I escaped my bubble and it was not safe. And then I, and then I yeah. crashed and burned. And so I'm a little bit hesitant to leave my bubble again. Right. Well, does, what does it mean to be out of the bubble? Must maybe be, I never left it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you left it with one foot. And, and, then it, it, and then it hurts. It hurts. It's sort of like, you know, saying, you know, let's get an injection, but you sort of eh, halfway or let's give a punch, yeah. but you give it with a soft punch, you know, and, yeah. and, and you break your wrist. So, right. So maybe I need to leave it in a more proper sense. I don't, I really don't know what that would translate in, in my case. <laughs> I, I have suspicions as to my case, but I don't know as to how I don't know. Well, if it is, if it does mean to meet the dangerous man um, and to meet yourself as a dangerous man in the company of a dangerous God, um, does that mean that you become a savage in Huxley's terms? Or is there an alternative? Because as you know, in Brave New World, Huxley recognizes that it, it was a, he gave a lousy ending that the story really uh, should have made allowance for an alternative that was not savagery um so what does it mean to step out of that the the technocratic cave does it mean to enter into the the caveman's cave is that <laughs> what it means oh well, we're all cave that's what it was that's what it was in my case we, we have our choice of caves. <laughs> you don't have to, uh, oh, but you know, if you don't fit, then that means that you're a criminal, you're, you're a madman, you're a, a drug addict, you're, a, you name it. You go berserk yeah. because you're outside of the system. And again, the columns, the Herculean columns, you go through them and the monsters will eat you up. You'll fall because after the point, oop, it just goes down, the ocean goes down, and you fall into hell. So is that what happens to us? Or perhaps we have not quite yet understood what it means to step out. I don't think I have understood it. <laughs> okay. I'm yeah. not going to pretend I have either. <laughs> not fully. Intimations. Slowly, painfully. Okay. okay. Rising to intimations. Okay. All right. But, you know, do, do we need guidance? Well, you know, we have our sources, dialogue. What does it mean? And, and, and I work on this in this uh, article that's coming up. I don't know when they will place it up there. But um, you know, what does it mean to be a man, a dangerous man? Where are we alive? Well, what does it mean to be free? Are we the repositories of freedom? So that freedom is the self-determination of the self, of the individual, or do we partake in freedom to the extent that we place ourselves in the context of dialogue, logos. Logos becomes my context. 
Okay. The dialogue with who? Ha. Huh. Dialogue as ethics. Ethics as dialogue, which is to say with the other. The other can is my poetic interlocutor, my partner in dialogue. Could be the author of the book that I am reading. Could be the fellow I meet in the street, the gal that is my neighbor. Um, meeting this other. Unfortunately, in our society, the other has been replaced with the different, the clown, the, you know, the society that confronts the other is a society that it is exposed to danger. The society that praises difference is a farce. There is no qualitative hierarchy. You know, there is no, you know, difference in hierarchy with, you know, the, the, the discourse of dif difference is a discourse that uh, destroys hierarchy and that therefore um, has gotten rid of to the extent that it can pretend to have done so um, of the, this other, you know, the human contact, human contact, it does not mean that you have two billiard, ball, billiard balls that bump into each other. It, it, it means that you discover your mortality in the human being who is before you. And without that encounter, you are not going to discover your mortality. There's a recent interlocutor of mine who says, you know, everything is eternal. We're all eternal. I said, all right. But, and yet, and yet, um, Icarus should have listened to his father. So what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. Well, we're all eternal, but we're not all eternally in the same state. Most importantly, to discover your real, you know, it's it's easy to say we're eternal, but to discover the meaning of the etern that eternity is impossible if not if you don't go through death. Just as it is impossible to love someone by eliminating the problem of death, throwing it out of the window. So people who say, I love you, let's go have fun and pretend that there is no such thing as death mm -hmm. are fooling each other. They're not, they don't love each other. They are denying, using each other to deny death. They're mm -hmm. using each other to deny death. And then they say, we love, I love you, I love you. No, I'm using you to deny death. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. You can only love one in the face of death. And you don't mm. really love anyone who is immortal, period. You know, the immortal God who, no, the only God who is lovable is a God who dies. And in whose death you recognize the truth. But that truth is necessary <laughs> if you want to have true love. <laughs> And you're not going to see it if, you know, you could, sure, we're eternal, the guy tells me. Yes. but And yet, I said, Severino died in 2020. Hmm. Severino was this guy who was saying everything is eternal. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well. It's uh, quite something to have on a, on a headstone. There's, there's a guy I know who's in hospice care right now. And... Um, He's, he's become delusional and uh, you know, a lot of people get become delusional right before they die. And you can, you, you, you can talk about the neurology of that and how there might be had a scientific explanation, but I, I tend to think that people get delusional before death because they still, even at death's door, just can't, can't face it. Can't face the grim reality of death and so you know this guy has a fantasy that he's gonna go back to his house or he's 
you know, his, his sister stole the, the family property 30 years ago from him. And he, he still is fantasizing about getting back that property. There's no way it's going to happen, but it's like, he's got to hold on to that dream because if he lets go of that delusion, all it's facing him is the grave. This is very important, Chris. This is very important. Letting go. Uh, the modern in, the human being who has uh, who has bought this lie and who has uh, uh, trapped himself, who has entered into this lie, into this bubble, um, believes that life is all about grasping and grabbing and acquiring. But this is the main, you know, and then we have to acquire. So this is a future-oriented, progressive way of life. You mm -hmm. are acquiring acquisition. You're building. Yeah. We're all yeah. building the new society. We, we want to be the masters of the future, of our destiny. And of course, today in our uh, profound cynicism, we can say that only tongue-in-cheek. We are the masters of our destiny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but um, it's all about acquiring and why well it, it is it is a principle ingrained in the constitution of the cartesian self the cartesian ego as you know is uh, res cogitans there is no res extensa proper to it it is a pure blank slate entity mm -hmm. um you, Joachim, you're out of the, the range. I, nobody would be able to shoot you if you remain outside of the... Um, so the... The Cartesian self um, needs to <clears throat> be filled with, with the, the outside world uh, to acquire meaning and significance. Now, this means that he has to do everything that he can to conquer, to assimilate, he, you know, the conquistadores, uh, the colonial, mm -hmm. colonialism, which, by the way, Kant was all for, um, modern colonialism. Uh, all of this is about acquisition, okay? Uh, establishing, you know, expansion, yeah. uh, Moby Dick, you name it. Um, so the alternative would be a life that is essentially, this doesn't mean that you, you know, you, you throw everything away. That's, that again is a, is a warped form of grasping. Um, essentially a matter of letting go. Letting go. And you say, even up to the point where you let go of God. You say, what does that mean? Because everything that you grasp is a mask, is a certainty. If you let go to the extent that you, you, you bring yourself to letting go of things. You see, when the, when the Gospels uh, is refer to letting go of father, mother, all relations, for the sake of truth, because God will give you, right? This is the discourse, right? If you let go of one coin, God will give you a hundredfold, right? This mm -hmm. is the- L Unless a grain of wheat dies and there's no fruit. There you have it. You can, you can rephrase it, paraphrase it in many ways, right? Yeah. So a very pretty way of, of, of stating that. Um, so life, in the modern context, it's about acquisition, grasping, acquiring. But what is truly, yes, what is life really about? What is life? Is it this acquisition and competition that we then project onto the little cells and molecules and atoms? And we say, you see, that's what they do. You see? Mm -hmm. 
That's the way we, you know, see these little things that are eating each other and competing. Yeah. You see that? Right. It's competition. The big one grasps and then they say they can develop and, and succeed over the others. And but are we not projecting that Cartesian mentality onto everything that we see? Sure. You know, the Marxists, they would say, oh, you see, money, money, money. Freud says, sex, sex, sex. <laughs> right. Because he takes a darn sheet of paper, he cuts the circle or he cuts sex yeah, through and you have a sex hole and you see everything mm -hmm. through that hole and you see that which you have cut out everywhere you look. But that is an abstraction. And you see the word, you cut out fact and then you look everywhere and you see facts, facts, facts. Yeah. Whereas in reality, a fact is an abstraction. It's a modern abstraction from meaning. It's just a, another way of saying res extensa. It's something brutal, something that is just quantifiable and has no inherent quality. And so we can just grasp the facts and gather information it's all right. about acquiring and the more information you have, the more power you have. And, and, and actually we don't realize that all of this power is strangling us, that we are acquiring our own prison and right. we're trapped in it and it's suffocating us. So, you know, how should we live? How, what does it mean to live? And well, if we're not individuals who are there to grasp, how about starting to let go? And yeah. yeah, as we let go, we start to breathe. As we let go, we start, you know, there is no happiness without letting go. Of course not. And how just, can you love you someone know, without yeah. letting go? It's just the problem with letting go is you can even turn letting go into something you're trying to control. So, Well, that's just the word. Right. Then you're playing right. Semantics, but I'm letting go, you, you know, actually, you, you, right. what, I hear you, you know, as I said, you know, God, you know, somebody told me that you know, someone says that, you know, you let go of everything, but you have to grasp, keep, you know, hold on to God. Now, what tells you that the God you're holding on to is not just the mask of God? Yeah. Right. So you let go of that. I've had that experience. Yes. And yet I don't fully understand what, what it means to let go. I've had to do it so many times, even God. I have to let go yeah. and, and rediscover, but I, I don't know what it I don't know what it is that I've been doing. Yes. And I, I there's a lot of key aspects, even practically, in which I haven't done it, but I, I don't know what it is. Yes, yes. Well, well the, no, the, the what about, is. yes, what about your Achim, the, this notion that we have, this sense of certainty uh, that, that we are, you know, that we are in, in, in our experience, that the world, the context around us is experience or, or that, mm -hmm. that um, it experiences our own or we are experience and that we think within experience. Um, yeah. And somehow all of our notions become engulfed by this context, this empirical context, our experience that is always shifting. And so we grasp, we, we think, well, if I don't grasp God, then I'm going to lose it in this vortex of experience. You see? Right. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a very modern notion. Um, because it is not that thought is an experience, but the experience is within thought. And it is not I who think, but it is thought that thinks me. Hmm. So this, when I ask myself, for instance, I'm doing this thing, it's very important. Am I really feeling it? That's a mistake. You, your feelings count for nothing. For yeah. me, you know it's this feeling good about myself that is grounded ultimately in looking good instead of being good but once being good is important then feeling good is very you know loses all of its shine and allure because now 
there's something really important, which is being good. And not just looking good. But when looking good takes over the being good, then feeling good becomes all important. <laughs> right. Huh. Now, if thought is the context of experience and not the other way around, then it makes sense to say that, no, it is not I who think, but the thought that, that thinks me. And what am I to do then if not let go? And in letting go, expose myself. Because when I let go, I let go of my barrier. And when I let go of my barrier, I expose myself to danger. And that also means exposing myself to thought. It is not that I think, but that I expose myself to thought. Mm. And so when Nietzsche says, you know, I, I looked into meaning, and I'm going to paraphrase here, right? And when I, I looked into meaningless existence, and then after a while, I realized that it was meaningless existence that was staring at me. What we have here is a perversion of a classical platonic Christian recognition that if we look into, well, God, if we contemplate God long enough, we realize that it is God who is contemplating us. Um, what this means is that the God that I was contemplating was somehow not God himself who is contemplating me. Mm. That it was a kind of mirror of God or it was a kind of um, copy or even a mask of God. But if you look at that mask carefully enough, then you see it as a mirror that is not opaque. And then one day I shall see myself as God sees me. What does that mean? I'm paraphrasing mm. someone, you know. Um, so that would mean that uh, Nietzsche has distracted a lot of people, and not only him, of course, he's representing a whole, uh, you know, whole current, yeah, the whole um, way of life here, or of non-life, um, from the original sense of life and the, the, the true predicament in which we find ourselves in. Perhaps he got close and blinked. <laughs> Maybe that was his only mistake. Well, blinked. well, look, the fact that it is me, what he's looking at, he is assuming that it's meaningless life, that it's staring at him, and it's not yeah. God who is contemplating him. Notice the shift in yeah. verbs. Um, because there's no meaning. And so it just stares at you because it's, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he's, then he's disappointed. Yes, well, but, but you see, but it, it is compelling you to be creative now. Right. Well, it's so it's oh, fine. I'll do it. <laughs> you know? Just do it. I was, you just yeah. do it. You just do it, yeah. as the ad advertisement says, because mm -hmm. you're compelled, because what else is there to do? Do what? Do what? Just buy, buy do the it. Thing. Just what? do it. Anything. Just, do it. Come here. just do it. Just do it. Don't think about it. You think too much. Are you man enough? <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Yeah. I already did it. And, and, and so now, well, whatever we do becomes the meaningless expression of meaningless existence. Which are somehow supposed to be disjointed. But the, well, the, it's, it, the, the key here is the expression. Expressionism. Yeah. We are there to express ourselves. But in expressing ourselves, we're really expressing the meaninglessness of life. Thank you, Woody Allen. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> but so now what about the alternative? You see, it's very st st stark distinction here. If it is yeah. God who is contemplating me, what is the result of that? The compulsion to create meaningless 
replicas of the meaningless existence? No. I am no longer compelled to create. It is about returning, not producing something new, but returning to and taking care of what is left behind. What is left behind is always more important than what is acquired ahead of us. What's left, what's, I don't understand, what's left behind? You know the old stories, yes? Man ah. is going to see the Buddha. On the way, he sees a bum in the street. And he says, sorry, I don't have time for you because I'm going to see the Buddha. And depending on the version of the story, when he reaches the Buddha, either he cannot find him, he doesn't see anyone, or he sees the Buddha, but the Buddha he turns around and he is the man who was in the street that he had left behind. The point is that what is of importance is what we leave behind, not what we gain in the future that what we leave behind is always going to come back. There is no future without past because everything that goes in the past, if it is not met to the extent that you leave it behind, that you abandon, you know, it will come back in the new guise. If you try to escape from the past, escape from death, you will find that coming from the future. This is the miracle of life. It comes back. And you say, my gosh, I just thought I had left that behind me. And it's coming again. It's the same thing. It just changed colors. But basically, it's the same problem that I'm facing now. Why? Well, that's why. It didn't go anywhere. It, you know, you didn't leave it behind. You, you you leave it behind when you in, in your attitude, but when you leave it behind, that's why what you leave behind is important. Because as long as you don't turn around to what you left behind, it's gonna come back. And how do you turn around to attend to what you left behind? Well, it's a way of life. Reflection through discourse, you turn around to attend to, hence the conservative way of life which is not the progressive, properly understood conservative. So I don't trash, and I'm bringing up that conservative notion in this new paper, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what does the conservative do? Well, you know, and by the way, you know, there's, I'm referring to uh, Strauss's um, letter that he once wrote um, on conservatism. So what does the conservative do? Well, he, he conserves, right? he, he attends to what the good things of the past, what he left, what is left behind. So you, you, you know, you turn back, right, in your way of life. So what did I just leave behind? And if you attend to it, then it's not going to come back at, to 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 curse you as a curse. You know, you're not going to be trapped. There's, uh, there's a myth uh, about the chariot made of toenails. I don't know what's who, who where that's from, but there's there's something about a, ch a chariot of scattered toenails that comes at the end in the end times to wreak havoc. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, if you want to escape this uh, Sisyphus's uh, <laughs> uh, predicament. Um, If, if you abandon everything and, and move into the future, well, you see the past coming back with vengeance from the future. Sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, should, it should be obvious, but uh, this is not and, the way people are told to live. <laughs> and the opposite is called resurrection, yes? The inverse. Stepping out, stepping out of that loop is to resurrect. Yeah. You're coming out of that loop. Um, freedom from 
yields to freedom four. And in this article again, which is very lengthy, very hefty, <laughs> I do refer to this in terms of samsara and nirvana. Samsara in the Sanskrit notions, yes? Samsara is this repetition of the some same, and the loop, mm. the same of compulsions mm. that repeat this, this circle of compulsions. To come out of that freedom from, because you're always running away from something. It's the world of fear. To come out of samsara is to recognize that reality is not freedom from, but it's freedom for. So it's not negative infinity, but positive infinity. Not quantifiable infinity, but qualitative infinity. So the infinite perfection of being as opposed to infinite number of things so to speak. So that is nirvana. Nirvana is nir, the letting go. Yes, so, you know, you know, yes? The opinion that the opinion that everything worthwhile is already accomplished in the fullness of the origins. The beginning is good. The beginning is perfect. Yeah. This is the classical position, not the materialist, but even then, even then, there's no moving forward, really. No. You're stuck with the, you know, it's just, you know, you want to contemplate the, the, the swamp. But, uh, but. Right, the vortex is under society. It's not behind. It's not, it's not pushing yeah. society, but it's just under there and it's this abyss. And you stare into it, as it were. You contemplate um, it, but it's not, you're not going to be, you contemplate it. You contemplate it. Right. You don't. It's not, it doesn't make you creative. No, you don't want to build a new society based on that vortex. The society is to be shunned for the ancient materialists, and you want to turn back to this vortex and be one with its vortex. And incidentally, this vortex is not material in the modern sense of res extensa, absolutely not. Again, I, I refer to this in the article. When Democritus is saying that the what is fundamental is atoms in the void. Neither atoms nor the void are empirical entities. That should be clear. So the atom, of course, is not understood in, in, metaphorically as we do today. The atom is that which cannot be you know, divided. So it is this point, but what cannot be divided is not in space. So it obviously is not uh, an empirical entity. It has to be contemplated. So it is an object that receives the, 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 the qualities, the characteristics of mind. Mind projects itself into an individual, <laughs> which is this atom. And at the same time, the atom is in a void. The void is empty. It is not void in the sense that this room is void of, 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 of objects that are visible. It is void in the absolute sense that it has, it is timeless. So reality is timeless and without space. It is the the world of contemplation. Right, so space that, is full of div divisible objects. Well, space has to have um, uh, boundaries, but you know it, it has to. Yes, yeah. you have to be able. You know, it has to be divided. Uh, I mean, it has to. Be, it's, there's A and there's B and something in the middle. Uh, so, but there is no such thing. It's only A. There's a lot, lots of little A's. <laughs> but these yes, A's are what? They're in the void. This void is absolute void. That means that there is, this is a very tricky thing. You cannot think about it in spatial terms. If it were absolute void, then there would be no space, you see? Because you would have dots. You would have something yeah, you know, no space, right. to measure it. Yeah. But you cannot measure absolute void. So the absolute void is none other than the mind. And the dots are none other than the determinations of the mind. So when you say that there are, the reality is about atoms in the void, is to say that really um, there is mind and it's, it's, the, it's determinations. And this is fundamentally yes. what is the case. Only, the, the only thing with Democritus as a pre-Socratic is that 
he he it's an extravaganza. Well, there, in, uh, there is familiar no, terms. There's nothing good about it. Yeah. <laughs> you left that little good. What's desirable about it? I mean, what's what's good about it? And you know, where is it going? And and what is more, there's no hierarchy, right? There's no mm -hmm. good. There is no hierarchy of of, of value, because if there's no good, there's no better or worse. And this is not real, because we know how do you account for the society that has been teaching you? How do you account for your father? Yeah, Chris. How do you account for your father if if all there is is mind and it's and it's just you know this is flat determinations, atomic determinations. The twelve-year-old in the comments wants to speak up <laughs> at this point. Huh? Huh? Yeah, you'd have to say some really nasty things. <clears throat> To to account for the father, to what? Well, well, to account for why why the 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 father finally is uh, uh, to be dissolved into this uh, to this void. Okay. So, so this this uh, vulgar notion that we have uh, we're used to of ancient materialists. Um. It is just doesn't make any sense. Why would they have progress come to the rescue? It feeds right into it. It just it begs the question. You know, it's it's everybody's been, it, everybody's been a, a Cartesian from the beginning of time, even if they didn't know it. But right, no right, right. So so they the, you. Uh, forget about the the progress in the future you project back that what well so what about the society well that's why it's there is, is, is that what you mean like that 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 that's the line of thinking well that, you know the ancient materialists must have looked at matter and said this is a res extensa mm -hmm. and so yes we don't you know what is the of course the, the modern has to or you know is compelled within his bubble to legitimize himself and he says well projecting himself onto the beginning of time and you know I mean, this is this is of course an old trick that um authorities have always played you know the the, the muslims will look at the at the beginning and say you know we we come from the beginning you know there there are traces of us throughout <laughs> you see it is all about us i'm going to certain christian authorities were doing the same thing we've to justify us, we have to go along the whole path and see they see this was already an intimation of us coming here. Right? So everything um, points to our coming. And so they needed to keep the Jews because the Jews were there to to as evidence that you see, this account is 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 true, it's real. But of course that is limited because it goes back. You know, it, it relies on the other, it relies on the other, and the other is is not expendable. And so there's this, uh, with Islam, the situation is different. But with modernity, which consolidates this this great uh, delusion that was explored in Islam, uh, that, that gets, you know, that becomes really perfect science. <laughs> absolute, which means absolute certainty. You know, it's... We got that. We turned that uh, into a science. <laughs> we project us ourselves, our system, onto absolutely everything. God Himself. Islam did not try to do that one, but you know we project it on God Himself. So, uh, but this is all about grasping, acquiring certainty, acquiring other things, reducing them to differences, and denying their alterity. Nothing can stand on its own. I have to go and take over in the name of freedom because I, I love you. So therefore you must be mine. You must be reduced to sameness. I must deny your alterity. And, you know, I hate alterity. And those who hate alterity, you know, want to rape it, want to efface it. 
if it does not assimilate. You don't agree. You don't want to be reduced to difference. You don't want to be reduced to this game of meaninglessness. This pornographic scene, I will rape you. If you don't want to play that game, you see. And the more I perceive you as innocent, as other, because you see, I have already become corrupt. So, and the more I find you offensive, Socrates is offensive. The little girl is offensive just by being outside of my cycled circle of perversion. Mm -hmm. so, and so I must attack. I had a dream about a, a, a sort of a, a puppet show kind of thing of a princess and a dragon. The, the princess was locked high up in a tower and yeah. the dragon is curled around the tower. There's a crack in the tower through which the dragon on occasion drags the girl to um, have her look with her big googly eyes uh, on the lookout for search parties coming to take the girl away. The dragon thinks it's the girl's mother, right? The princess's mother. Mm. And the princess calls her mother. Uh, but what turns out when she's back in the tower, she takes off this sort of mask and these eyes she's wearing. Um, she's, she's a beautiful little princess. She's not a dragon. She looked like a dragon before, like a big maw, big you know, icicle-like teeth made of cloth, you know, weird puppet thing. She doesn't look like that. She's, she calls the dragon mother and she dresses up this way to stay the dragon's jealousy. Uh, the dragon keeps her there because the dragon hates her, hates her guts. Can't stand it. This was your dream? This is, yeah, this is my dream uh, this past week. Uh, Congratulations. That's <laughs> <laughs> a bit unsettling. But, okay. You know, this... Um, yeah, this followed uh, on, on a dream where I was on a march with my uh, political party, my compatriots, so we say, and I met some of my old friends and they were pestering me about my, uh, you know, my alliances. And I, I realized, like, I can't, you know, I can't have this conversation. I have to, you know, shove them out of the way. And I didn't feel good about it. And then later I had that dream and, you know, lots of other dreams like that lately, really. So, sounds sounds similar to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, the, the the dragon hates that little hates that little girl calls calls her daughter. Exposing ourselves, her. exposing ourselves. You know, very often there there's a problem because we, we assume that to look into hell is sinful. It is mm -hmm. not to look into hell that is sinful. It, it, it is to take it for granted. <laughs> yeah. Not to take it seriously. To be native to it might be a problem. <laughs> so, in fact, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, exactly, but, but also to shun it without thinking. Because yeah. those who say, you know, oh, this is evil and I, you know, I'm not going to look at it, um, that, is, that is a problem. I mean, that is, you could say, is sinful. And it's hypocritical, you could also add. Mm -hmm. Um. But to look at the at into hell and say, okay, I, I, I've done it, big deal. I look at it superficially, voyeuristically, okay, mm -hmm. as we're all used to doing on these, de -de 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 -de, you know, <laughs> it's all newspaper. It started with the newspapers, 1800s. Mm -hmm. And then it moved right. on, and before you know it, you're all foo, 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 foo. <laughs> next, 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 right? right. Picture, 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 picture. <laughs> and and so right. you're. It is not what you look at that is the problem. It could be hell, it could be the ho horrible thing. So oh, you're not supposed to look. No, that's not the problem. The problem is taking it for granted. Mm -hmm. Not to stop and say, what does this mean? Why is it here? <laughs> that is the problem. Going into hell is fine, provided, provided that um, there's, it, it's in the context of, of the light. You know, the, 
the doctrine of of Jesus entering the the, the, the underworld, right? The, into, into hell. Throwing a film. Absolutely. Soon to be a major motion oh. picture by Mel Gibson. Is that again? Mel Gibson is coming out with a sequel to The Passion of the Christ about yes. the heroine of hell. Is that is that the the precise uh, topic? The yeah, basically, it's it's all going to take place in hell. <laughs> well, I, it's like real life. I I, I can guess that there's going to be a lot of blood. Yeah, 